So Matt Majinski here with Brandon Scoopy Robinson. Thanks for joining me. Um, I really wanted to start out and talk about the racial issues and injustice in our country, specifically with, you know, what's been going on in the NBA. But I wanted to start with your thoughts and reactions about the shooting of Jacob Blake. You know, I still haven't watched that video. Wow. Um, combination of been busy, combination of not interested. Like I've seen it and then I, I scroll, but like, yeah, I, um, I don't know. I, I think that at the end of the day, man, whether he's black, white, green, orange, or purple, um, whether or not he has a prior or what, um, he was an unarmed man. And uh, I don't know about you, but nobody deserves to be shot. So is my answer um, in the long run. I think preconceived notions um, dictate how law enforcement and others deal with human beings. So there you have it. What steps would you what like steps? to be, uh, you know, taken to see more justice and less police violence? Um, I think a conversation is a starting point. Um, but, I, but I also think, um, as Kenny Smith shared with me today, um, in the quote, he said, um, the players have shown that the only way that at times we can let everyone know the ramifications of injustice is to show how powerful they are. And I think that, um, unfortunately, I've heard this from other people, in order to get justice, sometimes you, you have to overreact. Um, and I'm not advising violence or anything, but um, you have to stop always begging for validation. You have to uh, command it and demand it. You talk about overreacting in that way. And one thing I think the NBA does real well is, you know, they decided to boycott the playoffs right from the start. And yet again, they're the first league to take action, whatever it is, whether it's coronavirus related, whether it's related to this. Do you think they got their message across by boycotting those games? Yeah, I think they got it across. Um, I'm still getting a lot of the information on what happened in the meeting. Um, and I should have that by the end of the night. Um, but what I can tell you is that I think um, I've spoken to some players and some retired players as well that, that basically ask this question, what is the plan? So I, I think, you know, it's a start. It brings awareness. But what is the plan? Um, and I think Kyrie Irving started them right. I think in some respects, however, the fact that they stopped, it actually shows that they have more power because it's in transit versus saying no and not showing up. So um, I think this is a pivotal moment. Is there anything that you've heard over the past couple of months from NBA players that, you know, really stuck with you about their thoughts and feelings towards all of this? I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's a mixed bag. There are some guys that want to play. There are some people who say that it's not safe. I think the advantage that the NBA does have uh, is, is legitimately the fact that no one has tested positive for COVID, even in the wake of Williams enjoying his, um, his wins at, at Magic City. Um, but what I'll say to you is um, there were concerns about players who just did not want to go. You know, that's just the, the truth. So um, I, there are people who wanted to go. You know, last night in the meeting with the players and others, in that room, there was a belief um, by many they didn't want to go because they were angry, ticked off, pissed off about a lot. And um, I think that was just venting in frustration. I think now, you know, they have to decide what is that they actually want to do. You know, there's one thing that crossed my mind is as they look towards finishing these playoffs, a potential lockout next season, because it's clear to me that the NBA players want something done for real. Do you think a lockout – is a, uh, you know, something that could happen. I mean, it's been discussed even before all of this went down, um, particularly because of China um, and because of just a recession, the fact that there's no fans, the fact that we're looking at a digital space right now, there's a lot of factors that are involved. So I, in answer to your question about the lockout, um, this is something that was imminent even before now. Um, and so I, I can't give you a yay or nay, it's just a 50-50 split right now. Brandon, how can the NBA and really sports in general help America overcome the racist institutions that really affect so many people? I think that sports is a good um, unifier, um, but I do believe that racism is taught. Um, 
in the home, um, amongst your community and your friends and your family. So I don't, I think race and race relations in sports is a distraction, um, but I also think for players who, uh, in, in an NBA that's majority, 80% African American, you have your JJ Reddick, your Kyle Corvers, who, um, I guess the word I'm looking for are, are, are in some ways, the token white guys, uh, and I mean that in the most respectful way. Um, I think they, are, there's a level of awareness from them and vice versa, but I think until you infiltrate the thought process, it's still business as usual. And sometimes racism is not always blatant. Sometimes it's just not aware. And I think when you exhibit race, so actions against people, the response is what exit on. Brandon, thank you for joining me today. But, you know, I do want to end with this. I know that you've said, we've both said it, that conversation is key. It's the first step, but, it, but it's a big step. So I want to ask you if there's anything else you'd like to express that I haven't asked that I haven't touched on yet. No, can't think of anything, brother, but thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Brandon. My man, I'll talk to you soon.